Welcome back. In this video, you will learn how to graph polar equations. Let's get to it. All right, so in the last two lessons, you were introduced to polar coordinates and polar equations and how to convert them into their rectangular counterparts. But now what we're going to do is kind of put those concepts together and look at polar graphs. Because polar graphs are the result of being able to sketch polar equations, which we can do with the help of polar coordinates. And so remember that polar equations are typically in this form right here. We have r is equal to some function of theta, and for a given value of theta, we can output a particular value of r that will give us our polar coordinates of r comma theta. Plotting different pairs of polar coordinates from a polar equation is going to result in points that we can connect to sketch the graph of a polar equation. And now just as a little refresher, here are some examples of some polar equations. You can have an equation where you just have r equal to some constant. You could also have an equation where you just have theta equal to some angle, or you could have more complicated polar equations such as r equals three times cosine theta, r equals secant theta, or sometimes you'll even see an equation where you have r squared, such as this equation right here, where r squared is equal to four times sine of two theta. Now, each of these different polar equations are going to have different graphs, and that's going to be the focus of this video. We're going to look at how to identify what type of graph is going to result from different types of polar equations, and then mainly how to actually sketch the graphs for those polar equations. And so there's going to be a couple ways to go about this. One way to sketch polar graphs is to simply make a table of r values and theta values and then plot the points and connect them. And typically that method is accompanied by using symmetry for your polar equations. But we'll look at that in a little bit. That's going to be helpful for more complicated polar graphs and polar equations. But first I wanna focus on some very basic polar graphs where that method of creating a table of values is not really going to be necessary. Okay, so here's our first two basic polar graphs that we're going to look at. Let's start with this one on the left here. This polar graph that we have right here is represented by r equals a, where a is some constant. And when you see r equals some constant a, you know that you're working with a circle centered at the origin of your coordinate system with a radius of that constant a. And so this would be the same as x squared plus y squared equals some radius squared in the rectangular system. All right, so if you look at our graph here, here is our circle centered at the origin where the radius of the circle is that value of a. And it's important to note here that the value of a could be positive or negative and you would still have the same circle centered at that origin. It doesn't matter if you have positive a or negative a, your circle is still going to have a radius of a and it will be centered at the origin or at that pole. All right, so that's our first basic polar graph. You just need to know r equals a or r equals some constant is going to give you a circle centered at the origin with a radius of a. Now for our second basic polar graph, we have theta equals a, where a is a value of an angle. And when you see theta equals some value, you know that you're looking at a graph of a diagonal line with a slope of tangent of a. And this comes from being able to convert polar equations into rectangular equations. When you convert a polar equation of theta equals some angle, that is the same as y equals tangent of a times x. And so that is a linear equation where you have a slope of tangent of a. All right, so that is the rectangular equivalent. But as you can see in our graph here, we just have a diagonal line that runs along the angle that theta is equal to. So for example, if theta was equal to pi divided by four, then that's actually what we're looking at right here. This diagonal line is right in between the angle of pi divided by two and zero, which is pi divided by four. And so whatever theta is equal to, that is the angle that your diagonal line is going to run along. All right, and if that value of a, or if that angle is negative, this diagonal line will change, unlike our basic graph for a circle, what's going to happen is your diagonal line is going to reflect along this vertical axis that we call theta equals pi divided by two. All right, so if theta was equal to negative pi divided by four, instead of having our diagonal line right here, we would have it in this direction instead. All right, so those are the first two types of basic polar graphs that you need to be aware of. Now let's look at a couple more. And so here's our next set of basic polar graphs. These two types of polar graphs are vertical and horizontal lines. 
So let's start with our vertical lines. When you see a polar equation of r equals some constant times secant theta, you know that you are dealing with a vertical line. In particular, you're working with a vertical line that passes through that value of a along the polar axis, which is the same as the x-axis, right? So if you look at our vertical line here, it crosses through that value of a. So if this circle here represented a radius of a, then that value of a along the polar axis is where that vertical line is going to cross through. But if that value of a is negative, that vertical line is going to flip sides of this vertical axis. All right, so instead of having r equals a times secant theta, if we had r equals negative a times secant theta, then our vertical line would be on the opposite side of that vertical axis, theta equals pi divided by two. All right, so this is where that vertical line would be if a was negative. And so I'll just make a note of that. This is when r equals negative a times secant theta. All right, and that's because this value right here would also be a radius of a. If this circle here represents a radius of a, that distance would be measured in this direction and this direction. All right, so if a is positive, you're on the right side of the polar coordinate system, and if it's negative, you're on the left side. Okay, and just one more thing to point out about these vertical lines is that they are the same as x equals a in the rectangular coordinate system. So x equals a would be the same as this vertical line, and x equals negative a would be the same as this vertical line. Okay, now let's look at our horizontal lines. Horizontal lines occur when you have r equals a, some constant, times cosecant theta, and specifically, that horizontal line passes through the value of a along that vertical axis, theta equals pi divided by two, or you could think of it as the y-axis. All right, and you can see that in our graph here. This vertical line is represented by r equals a times cosecant theta, and it passes through that value of a along this vertical axis. So once again, if this circle here represented a radius of a, that would take us to this value of a along the polar axis, but it would also take us to this value of a along this vertical axis, theta equals pi divided by two. And then similar to our vertical lines, if a is negative, then it's going to flip sides. The horizontal line is not going to be above the polar axis, it will be below the polar axis. All right, so our line would look something like this if a was negative. So this would be our line if we had r equals negative a times cosecant theta. All right, because this value right here is also where the radius is a because it's along that same circle that represents a radius of a. So if a is positive, your horizontal line is above the polar axis, and if it's negative, you are below the polar axis. And then one more thing to point out is that these horizontal lines are the same as the rectangular equation y equals a. All right, so if you have y equals some constant, that would be the same as these horizontal lines here. Okay, so those were our basic polar graphs that involved straight lines. Now we're going to look at two more basic polar graphs that involve circles. Okay, so here's our last set of basic polar graphs that we're going to look at. Later in this video, we'll look at some more special polar graphs that are a bit more complicated, but these are the last two types of polar graphs that I would label as basic. Firstly, we have this graph of a circle. This is represented by r equals some constant a times cosine theta. And when you see a polar equation like this, you know that you are working with a circle that has a diameter of a on the right side of theta equals pi divided by two. That's the vertical axis, all right? So our circle, as you can see here, has a diameter of a, and it rests on the right side of that vertical axis, theta equals pi divided by two, and it's also centered along the polar axis, all right? Half of the circle is above the polar axis, and the other half is below it. But if that constant a is negative, our circle is going to flip from being on the right side to being on the left side. So if a was negative, our circle would be on this side of the graph instead, okay? So that is when you have negative a, okay? So that's r equals a times cosine theta, but now over here we have r equals a times sine theta. a is still some constant being multiplied by this trig function, and when you see r equals a times sine theta, you know that you are working with a circle that still has a diameter of a, but now it's on top of the polar axis and it is split by the vertical axis, right? You can see we have that circle with a diameter of a and it rests up top of this polar axis and it is split by the vertical axis, 
theta equals pi divided by two. But now if that value of a is negative, then this circle will flip from being on top of the polar axis to being below the polar axis. So if a was a negative, our circle would look something like that. All right, so that circle right there is if a is negative, okay? So those are our last two basic polar graphs. But now what I wanna do is switch gears because what we've been looking at so far are the most basic polar graphs, but there are other polar graphs that are going to be much more complicated. And so what we're going to do is first look at a method that is going to allow us to graph any polar equation by plotting polar coordinates, and then we'll look at some rules that we can use for some special polar graphs that will allow us to sketch certain types of polar equations a lot more quickly. All right, and so here's the method that we're going to use for graphing any polar equation. What we're going to do is find some points for our polar equation, some pairs of polar coordinates, and then make use of symmetry for our equation to then plot some more points and then quickly see what the shape of our polar graph will be. And so there's three different types of symmetry that we could find that is going to allow us to quickly sketch these graphs. All right, so for some given polar equation where we have r is equal to some function in terms of theta, we can check to see if that function of theta is equal to that function evaluated at negative theta. If this is true, what that tells us is that our polar equation or our graph has symmetry about the polar axis. It will be the same above the polar axis as it is below it. But now if our function evaluated at pi minus theta is equal to the original function f of theta, then you know that you have symmetry about the vertical axis theta equals pi divided by two. The graph will look the same on the right side as it does on the left side. And then finally, this one we're not gonna use too much. This is the last type of symmetry that you might have. It's kind of a last resort. You only really need to check this if the first two types of symmetry fail. If your graph doesn't have symmetry about the polar axis or about the vertical axis, and what this symmetry is, it's symmetry about the pole or the origin, meaning that you could rotate your graph 180 degrees and have the same shape. And you can check that by plugging theta plus pi into your function and seeing if it's equal to the negative version of your original function f of theta. Okay, so once again, this is a last resort. In most cases, you're probably not going to have to check this last type of symmetry. These first two types of symmetry are going to be the most common. And so let's take a look at an example where we graph a more complicated polar equation by using polar coordinates and symmetry. All right, so here we wanna graph r equals one plus cosine theta by plotting points and using symmetry. Now it's important to note here that this polar equation does not look like any of our basic polar equations or basic polar graphs that we looked at earlier. This is a completely new type of polar equation. And so we can't just quickly plot this to be a circle or a line or a diagonal line it's going to be some other shape. This actually will be one of our special types of polar graphs that we will look at at the end of this video. But for now, I wanna kinda of keep it a secret on what shape this is until we graph it. So let's start our process here. The first thing that you wanna do, if you wanna graph a polar equation by plotting points and using symmetry, is to check for symmetry. You wanna see if our graph is going to be symmetric about the polar axis or the vertical axis, theta equals pi divided by two. Now, if both of those fail, then we can check for symmetry about the pole, but in most cases, you're not going to have to do that. All right, so let's check for symmetry. The first thing that we wanna check is to see if f of theta is equal to f of negative theta. And if this is true, then our graph is going to be symmetric about the polar axis, our horizontal axis, all right? So in this case, f of theta, our function in terms of theta is one plus cosine theta. So if we plug negative theta into this function, let's see if we get the same function back. All right, so if f of theta is equal to one plus cosine theta, then f of negative theta, that's what we're testing, would be equal to one plus cosine of negative theta. Now, one of the properties of cosine is that it is symmetric about the y-axis. It's an even function. So that results in one of the identities for cosine, that cosine of a negative angle is just equal to cosine of the positive version of that angle. So this is equal to one plus cosine theta, right? F of negative theta is equal to one plus cosine theta. Cosine of negative theta is going to be the same as cosine theta, all right? And so what we find here is that F of negative theta is equal to F of theta right? One plus cosine theta 
is our original function, and we got that back when we plugged in negative theta, and so this check for symmetry is true, and so what we learn here is that our graph is going to be symmetric about the polar axis. All right, so whatever we plot above the polar axis will be the same below the polar axis. That's going to save us some time. That means that we're only going to have to find points above the polar axis, and then we can just reflect them to complete the sketch of our graph. But now, before we start finding points and plotting them, we should also check to see if we have symmetry about the vertical axis. And that symmetry will occur when f of pi minus theta is equal to the original function f of theta. All right, if this is true, then we have symmetry about our vertical axis. All right, so let's check that. In this case, we will plug pi minus theta into our function f of theta. So we'll have that f of pi minus theta is equal to one plus cosine of pi minus theta. Now, in order to check to see if this will be equal to our original function of one plus cosine theta, we're going to need to make use of a trig identity here specifically our subtraction identity for cosine. And if you don't remember, cosine of a minus b is equal to cosine of a times cosine of b minus sine of a times sine of b. So in this case, this is going to be equal to one plus cosine of pi times cosine theta minus sine of pi times sine theta, all right? pi is a and theta is b, and so if we replace those values for a and b in this identity, we get this expression right here. Okay, so now if we simplify, cosine of pi is equal to negative one, so this is equal to one minus cosine theta. This cosine theta is not going to simplify, and then we have minus sine pi times sine theta, but sine pi is equal to zero, so we have zero times sine theta, which will be zero, and so we're subtracting zero, so we have minus zero, but that's not going to affect our equation, and so we just have one minus cosine theta. All right, and so f of pi minus theta is equal to one minus cosine theta, which is not the same as our original function. So f of theta is not equal to f of pi minus theta, so we do not have symmetry about our vertical axis. We will only have symmetry about the polar axis. Okay, so now keeping all of that in mind, let's start finding some polar coordinates that we can plot in this system in order to sketch the graph of this polar equation. So let's start by making a table of some values. We're going to have our r values and our theta values. And what I recommend that you do is choose some nice values of theta or some nice angles for your polar equation that will allow you to easily determine some values of r. All right, but now remember, when we choose some values of theta here, we only need to work with values of theta above the polar axis because we know that we're symmetric about the polar axis. So if we can just plot some points above it, then we can reflect those points to the bottom and then draw our graph, all right? So we only need to work with angles from zero to pi. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna choose the following angles. Let's look at theta equals zero, theta equals pi divided by four, theta equals pi divided by two, theta equals three pi divided by four, and theta equals pi. All right, those are the angles I'm gonna look at. And so now what we can do is plug these values of theta into our function to get their respective values of r to make some polar coordinates. So if you plug zero in for theta, cosine of zero is one. So we have one plus one, which is two. So r is equal to two. When theta equals pi divided by four, we'll plug that in, and cosine of pi divided by four is the square root of two divided by two. So we'll have one plus the square root of two divided by two. So I'll write that down. We'll have one plus square root of two divided by two. Then for pi divided by two, we'll plug that in. Cosine of pi divided by two is zero. So we have zero plus one. So that will give us an R value of one. Now three pi divided by four, if we plug that in for theta, cosine of three pi divided by four is the negative square root of two divided by two. So we'll have one minus the square root of two divided by two. All right, so that's our value of R we'll have one minus the square root of two divided by two. And then for pi, if we plug that in, cosine of pi is a negative one. So we'll have negative one plus one, which is zero. So our value of r will be zero. Okay, so those are our polar coordinates. Now, sometimes it can be helpful before you actually plot them in your system to kind of draw a graph to relate r and theta that will kind of help you see what happens to your radius as your angle changes. So you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but I'm gonna draw a little graph to relate these two variables. What we'll have is r along this vertical axis 
and theta along this horizontal axis. This is not our polar graph, just a reminder. This is just going to help us see what happens to R as we get bigger and bigger angles. All right, so right here will be our angle of zero. Then we'll have pi divided by four, pi divided by two, three pi divided by four, and then pi. All right, and the biggest our value of R will be is two in this case. So up here I'll have two, and then right here will be one. So our first point when our angle is zero, we have a radius of two. So that will be right here. Our angle of theta is zero and our radius is two. When our angle is pi divided by four, we have one plus the square root of two divided by two. And that's approximately equal to 1.7. So our point will be somewhere right about here. So I'll plot that. That's about 1.7 along this axis. And then for pi divided by two, our radius is one. So that will be right here. So I'll plot that. And then for three pi divided by four, our radius is one minus the square root of two divided by two. And that's approximately 0.29 or 0.3. So that will take us down here somewhere. So I'll plot that point right there. And then our last point is for our angle of pi where r is equal to zero. So that will be right along this axis here. That will be our last point. And so now if we connect our points here, you can start to see that as our angle gets bigger, our value of r gets smaller. So when we plot these points and then connect them, we know that as we connect them, the radius of our shape should be getting smaller up until that angle of pi. All right, so let's plot these polar coordinates in this polar coordinate system. Let's start with our first point here. We have an angle of zero and a radius of two. So if our angle is zero, we're gonna be along this angle right here and a radius of two. If each of these circles represents an increase in the radius by one, then we will count one, two to get our radius of two right here. All right, this second circle will represent a radius of two. So that'll be our first point right there. Then our next point, we have a radius of one plus the square root of two divided by two and an angle of pi divided by four. So that angle of pi divided by four will take us halfway between zero and pi divided by two. That's right here. And like I said earlier, this radius of one plus the square root of two divided by two, that is approximately equal to 1.7. So if our radius is about 1.7, we're not going to be along this second circle and we're not going to be along this first circle where the radius is one. We're going to be somewhere in between them, but closer to the radius of two. So if we're along this angle right here, if that angle is pi divided by four, then our point will be somewhere right about here. That's where the radius is about 1.7. Okay, so that's that point. Now let's look at our next one. We have an angle of pi divided by two and a radius of one. The angle of pi divided by two is this angle right here. And if our radius is one, we're going to be along that first circle. So I'll plot that point. And now we can move on to our next point where we have three pi divided by four as our angle and one minus the square root of two divided by two. Now I said this earlier, but that value of R is approximately equal to 0.29 or basically 0.3. And so if we plot this point, that angle of three pi divided by four will take us to this angle. Three pi divided by four is halfway between pi divided by two and pi. So this angle right here is three pi divided by four and our radius is 0.3 basically. So for along this angle, we're not going to go all the way up to the radius of one. In fact, we're not even gonna be halfway there. We're right about here somewhere, which would be 0.3. So I'll plot that point right there. That's about where we will be. And then finally, we have one more point where we have an angle of pi and a radius of zero. So our angle of pi is going to be along this angle right here. That's where our angle is pi. And a radius of zero just means that we're gonna be at the origin. That's where the radius or the distance from the origin is zero. So I'll plot that point right there. And now we're done, we can stop. Because we know that this graph has symmetry about the polar axis, we don't have to plot any more points. We know that the points above the polar axis are going to be the same below the polar axis. All right, and so we don't have to plot any more points. What we really can do here is connect the points that we have and then reflect that shape to the other side of the polar axis. All right, and so let's connect our points. Remember from this graph over here that we know that the radius gets smaller as we get a bigger angle up until pi. And that seems to be true if we were to connect these points in that fashion. If we start at this point right here, as we would connect more and more points, our radius gets smaller until it's zero. So our graph will look something like that. And then if we reflect this shape to the other side of the polar axis, we will get a shape that looks like this, right? I just reflected the same shape that we drew by connecting those points to the other side of the polar axis. And now we have a completed graph of this polar equation.
All right, so what we really ended up with here is kind of this heart shape, right? It looks like we have a circle, but then we come into the origin and then come back out and complete the shape. And there's actually a name for this shape. We call this a cardioid because it's shaped like a heart. The word cardioid basically means heart. And so this is actually one of our special types of polar graphs that we are going to look at in just a moment. Okay, but that's the end of this example. Hopefully that process makes sense. In order to graph any polar equation without having to know any rules or memorizing any shapes for particular equations, all you have to do is check for symmetry for your polar equation and then find some polar coordinates from your equation that you can plot and then make use of any symmetry that you find to make drawing your curve or your graph a lot easier. And so you can do this process for any polar equation. But there are going to be some polar equations that are special. They represent some special polar graphs that you can try to learn how they look and recognize them so that you can graph them more quickly. Because believe it or not, you can actually look at this polar equation right here and instantly recognize it as a cardioid or as this heart shape without ever needing to check for symmetry or plotting any points. And so let's take a look at these special types of polar graphs next. All right, so the first type of special polar graphs that we're going to look at are what we call lemosomes. And there's a couple different types of lemosomes. The first type that we're gonna look at are the type that have an inner loop. That's what these two represent here. But what's important to realize about lemosomes is that they're all represented by the same form of a polar equation. The only difference is going to be the value of the constants in that equation. And so let's take a look at what we have here. These two equations, r equals a plus or minus b times cosine theta and r equals a plus or minus b times sine theta, these two equations are always going to represent some type of Lemassonne. But for these two graphs in particular, we are looking at the case where those constants a and b, when a is divided by b, the value is less than one. So when a divided by b is less than one, you're going to get these two special types of polar graphs known as lemosomes with inner loops. And so when your trig function is cosine, when you have a plus or minus b times cosine, that lemosome with an inner loop will be on the right side of the graph where the inner loop lies along the angle of zero. All right, and so similar to our basic graphs, remember that when you had r is equal to some constant times cosine, that it represented a circle on the right side that's kind of the same thing here. When you have r is equal to a plus or minus b times cosine theta, your lemosome is going to be on the right side of the graph, okay? And you can quickly graph a lemosome represented by this equation that has an inner loop by using those values of a and b to find some particular points that will allow you to create this shape, right? So for example, you can see that this lemosome is going to cross through the vertical axis at the value of a, above the polar axis and at the value of a below the polar axis. And then you'll also see that the inner loop crosses through the origin and then reaches out to a point where the value is the absolute value of a minus b. All right, so that's the value of the radius that it will reach to. Whatever the absolute value of a minus b is, that's where the inner loop will reach. And then the outside part of the limousine, you can find that value by adding a and b together. And so that's how you can take a polar equation of this form, r equals a plus or minus b times cosine theta, where a divided by b is less than one, and quickly draw a graph of that limousine with an inner loop. Now, if that trig function is not cosine, but it's sine, then similar to our basic graphs with the circle, the limousine will be on top of the polar axis instead of being on the right side of the graph. All right, so in this case, the inner loop is along the angle of theta equals pi divided by two, but then all the rest of these values are calculated the same way. The inner loop meets to a value of the radius, which is the absolute value of a minus b. The limousine will pass through the values of a along the polar axis now, instead of the vertical axis like it did in this graph. And then the outer part of the limousine is where you have a plus b. Whatever the value of a plus b is, that's where the limousine will reach to. All right, and then one more thing to mention here, this actually applies to all limousines that we're going to look at. For these two equations where we have r equals a plus or minus b times cosine theta and r equals a plus or minus b times sine theta, we're going to assume that the values of a and b are positive. And I know that doesn't quite make sense because we have plus or minus between those two values. But here's what's important to remember. If you have a plus sign between these two terms, if you have a plus b times cosine theta, or a plus b times sine theta, your graphs are going to look exactly like they do in these two graphs here. But if that sign is negative, not positive, 
then your graphs are going to be reflected. So in the case for cosine, this limousine with an inner loop will be reflected to the other side of this vertical axis. So the loop will be on this side of the axis and this back end will be over here. All right, and then in the case for sine, if we have a minus b times sine theta, then this graph will be reflected to the other side of the polar axis. So our loop will be on this side of the axis and this back end will be over here instead. All right, so just be aware of that. When you are subtracting this second term, you're going to be flipping the graphs from how they look in these two graphs that I have here. Okay, so this is the first type of a limousin, which is our first major group of special polar graphs. These are limousins with inner loops. Now let's look at another type of limousin. Here we have limousins that are classified as cardioids. This is what we just graphed in our previous example. When you have r is equal to a plus or minus b times cosine theta, or r equals a plus or minus b times sine theta, but where a divided by b is equal to one, then you have a cardioid or a heart shape. And so for cosine theta, that heart is on the right side of the graph. It reaches out to a radius of a plus b, and then it will pass through the value of a on either side of the vertical axis, and then it meets at the origin and comes back out. All right, but when that trig function is sine, then you're going to have this shape instead. The cardioid is on top of the polar axis. The top part that isn't the butt end will reach up to a point of a plus b, and then it will pass through the value of a along the polar axis, meet at the origin, and then pass back through the value of a on the other side of the polar axis and come back to a plus b. All right, and then one more thing, like I mentioned with our previous set of limousons, if you have a minus b times sine theta or a minus b times cosine theta, each of these graphs are going to be reflected. So if we have a minus b times cosine theta, this cardioid will be flipped to the other side. So this back end will be over here and the heart shape will come from this direction instead. And then for the case with sine theta, if we had a minus b times sine theta, then this cardioid would be flipped to the other side of the polar axis. And so this back end would be back here and we would come in and make a heart shape and then come back. All right, so just remember that if you have a subtraction sign that these graphs are going to flip. Okay, so these are the limousons or the cardioids where A divided by B is equal to one for these two equations that will always represent a limousine. Now let's look at our next type of limousine. Here we have limousines that do not have an inner loop, are not heart shaped, but rather have what we call a dimple. We essentially have the same shape but instead of coming in and having a loop, or instead of meeting at the origin, these limousines have a shape that kind of looks like someone took a tiny little bite out of a cookie. All right, you can kind of see that with these shapes. We have what looks to be a circle, but then it comes in and then it comes back out. That little motion of coming in and back out is what we refer to as the dimple. But you can recognize that a limousin will have a dimple when A divided by B is between one and two. It's not bigger than two and it's not less than one. When it's between one and two, you're going to have this little dimple in your graph. Okay, and so similar to the inner loop, the part where the dimple reaches to is the value of A minus B, but the absolute value of that difference. And the limousin with the dimple will reach out to the radius of A plus B and it will pass through the value of A below the polar axis and above the polar axis along that vertical axis. All right, so when you have cosine, that limousin is on the right side it's oriented such that the dimple is on this side of the graph. But when you have sine theta, it's oriented in this way where the dimple is on the bottom part of the graph and the majority of your limousin rests above the polar axis, okay? So once again, it reaches out to a value of R of A plus B. It passes through the value of A, comes back in where we have a dimple at the absolute value of A minus B, and then it comes back out, passes through A, and comes back to A plus B. All right, and then one more thing that I wanna mention, I've talked about this in the previous two types of limousons, that if you have R equals A minus B times cosine theta or R equals A minus B times sine theta, that the graphs of these limousons will be reflected or flipped. So for the case with cosine, the dimple won't be on the left side, the dimple will be on the right side. And then in the case with sine, the dimple will not be below the polar axis, it will be above. So this limousine would be flipped as well. Okay, so that was the third type of a limousine. These are limousines with dimples. And then finally, we have one more type of limousines. And here they are. They are what we call convex limousines. And these limousines don't look that nice. It's basically a circle that kind of got flattened on one end. You can kind of see that with both of these shapes. It looks like you have a nice circle and then it just kind of gets flat and then comes back. 
And so this type of a limousin, or a convex limousin, occurs when the value of a divided by b is greater than or equal to two. All right, so now we've covered all of our bases here. We've looked at the case where a divided by b was less than one. We looked at the case where a divided by b was equal to one. We looked at the case where a divided by b is between one and two. And now we're looking at the final case where a divided by b is greater than or equal to two. And so when that is true, for either of these equations, you know that you're going to have a convex limousin, okay? So when your trig function is cosine, once again, your limousin is basically on the right side of the graph, but the flat end of this convex limousin will be on the left side, and it will pass through the polar axis at the radius value of the difference between A and B, but the absolute value of that difference. The limousin still passes through A on either side of the polar axis along that vertical axis, and it will reach out to a radius of a plus b. All right, but then when your trig function is sine, the flat end is going to be below the polar axis, and the majority of the limousin will be above the polar axis. So it starts out like a circle, the outer part is at a radius of a plus b, then it will pass through a along the polar axis, then it will come back in and be flat to a value of a minus b, or the absolute value of a minus b, and then it will come back through a and back to a plus b. All right, and then once again, I do wanna mention this as well. If you have r equals a minus b times cosine theta or r equals a minus b times sine theta, if you don't have a plus sign but a negative sign between those terms, just like I explained with the other limousons, both of these graphs are going to flip. So in the cosine case, the flat end of the convex limousin will be on the other side of the graph and the more rounded side will be over here. And then in the case with sine theta, the flat edge will be above the polar axis and the more rounded side will be below the polar axis. So you just have to flip the limousons if you have a negative sign in your equations. Okay, so this is the last type of a limousin, the convex limousin. So now you have seen all of the different types of limousons, including the loop, the cardioid, the dimpled, and now the convex. All right, so those are all the limousons, but that's actually not the end of all of our special polar graphs. We have two more different groups, but they go a lot quicker. Our next group of special polar graphs are rose curves. And so there's two different types of rose curves. We have rose curves that involve cosine and then rose curves that involve sine. And so here's our rose curves that involve cosine. And here's the general form of the polar equation that is going to result in a rose curve. We have r equals some constant a times cosine of some constant n times theta. And this first graph that we're looking at here on the left side is where n is odd. And for both cases, or for all rose curves, that value of n needs to be greater than or equal to two. All right, so when n is odd, when this value of n is odd, you're going to have a rose curve with an n number of petals. All right, and so it looks like this. You can see that we have this curve that has three different petals. This is a particular case of a rose curve when you're dealing with cosine. This is the case where n equals three, which means that it is odd, which means that we have three petals. And when you're graphing a rose curve with cosine, the first petal that you should draw is always going to be along the angle of zero. It's going to be along that polar axis on the right side. And then after that, you just have to evenly distribute your other petals. So you start with this petal and then you have two more to draw in the case of n equals three. So you spread them out evenly and draw one over here and one over here. And each of those petals reaches out to a radius of a. All right, so whatever that value of a is, that determines how big each of those petals are going to be. All right, so this is the case where you have r equals a times cosine of n times theta, where n is odd, but where n is even, then the number of petals changes. The number of petals will be two times that value of n. So here's our example where n equals four. Since n is equal to four, that's an even number, so we'll have four times two petals. Four times two is eight, so we have eight petals. Once again, for cosine, you start with your first petal along that angle of zero, and then you just evenly distribute the rest of the petals. And that petal still reaches out to a radius of A. Okay, so in this case, since you have an even number of petals, it's probably safe to draw one along each of our four angles of zero, pi divided by two, pi, and three pi divided by two, and then just evenly distribute the rest between each of those petals. All right, and then one more thing that I wanna mention regarding both of these rose curves here is that if that value of a, that constant being multiplied by cosine in either case, if that is negative, you're going to need to flip or reflect your rose curve about the vertical axis. All right, so in this case, if we had this rose curve 
but this constant A was negative, this pedal would be flipped to the other side of this axis, and these two pedals would be flipped or reflected to the other side as well. All right, but in this case where the pedals are even, it really doesn't change anything. If A is negative, you technically would flip or reflect your pedals to the other side of the vertical axis. But as you can see, this is a symmetric curve. The curve is the same on the right side of this axis as it is on the left side. So when A is negative, you really don't have to worry about reflecting anything when you have an even number of pedals. All right, that's really all you have to know in the case where A is negative. Okay, so that's what the rows curves look like when you have this form of a polar equation involving cosine, but when it involves sine, it looks a little bit different and they're just a little bit more complicated. Okay, so here's our second set of rows curves. These are rows curves where we have a very similar polar equation to what we looked at before, but instead of working with cosine, we're working with sine. So in this case, we have R equals some constant A times sine of some value N times theta. And so both of these are represented by the same equation, but one is where n is odd and the other is where n is even. And so we have the same rules for our number of pedals as we did with cosine. If n is odd, we have an n number of pedals. And if n is even, we have two n number of pedals. And once again, that value of n needs to be greater than or equal to two. Okay, so this first one here, this is an example of where n is odd. In this case, we have n equals five, which means we will have five pedals. And you can see that we have those five pedals. And now when you sketch a graph of the rows curve where you have an odd number of pedals for the sine function, it's kind of tricky to determine where the pedal should go. But what I've noticed with the graphs is that there's pretty much always only one pedal along an axis. In this case, it's either going to be along this angle of pi divided by two or this angle of three pi divided by two. And then the rest of the pedals will not be on an axis but they will be evenly distributed or equally distributed around the rest of the system. All right, and the pattern that I've noticed is that with every odd number, the starting point of that pedal along the axis switches from being on top to bottom. So when n equals three, the first pedal is down here. When n equals five, the first pedal is up here. When n equals seven, the first pedal will be down here and so on. All right, so it kind of flips back and forth for each value of an odd number for n. And so once you draw that first pedal, then you just have to evenly distribute the rest of the pedals throughout the graph, okay? And just another note, each of the pedals will reach out to a radius value of A, which comes from that constant in front of the sine function, all right? So this is when N is odd for sine, but when N is even for sine, your rose curve will look a little bit different. Each of the pedals will still reach out to a radius of A, but now none of the pedals when N is even are going to be along an axis. So this is probably a little bit easier to graph. In this case, we have an example where n equals two. So we have two times two number of pedals, which gives us four pedals. So we know that we have to evenly distribute four pedals throughout this system where none of them will be along an axis. All right, so just for another example, if n was equal to four, we would have four times two number of pedals, which means that we would have eight pedals. So we would have to distribute eight pedals evenly throughout this system, but none of them would be along an axis. And so that means that we would have to have two pedals in each quadrant. So we would have two in this quadrant, two in this quadrant, that would be four pedals, then two in this quadrant to get six pedals, and then two in this quadrant to get eight pedals. All right, and then one more thing to mention regarding both of these rows curves is that if that constant of A in front of the sine function is negative, you may have to flip your graph. All right, so for example, in this case where we have an odd number of pedals, if our constant A was negative, we would flip our graph about the polar axis. All right, so this is the opposite of when we were working with cosine. When we had cosine for our rose curves, we reflected about the vertical axis, but for sine, you're going to reflect about the polar axis. All right, so this pedal would now be below the polar axis. These two pedals would be reflected up and these two pedals would be reflected down. All right, so you would have to reflect your graph about that polar axis if A is negative. Now in the case where you have an even number of pedals, because there are an even number of pedals, your graph is going to be symmetric. So when A is negative, reflecting your graph isn't really going to do anything. You're going to have the same graph. And so it's not going to look any different. So you don't have to worry about doing anything in that case. It's just that when you have an odd number of pedals and A is negative, you will have to reflect your graph to account for that negative value of A. All right, so sketching the graph of rose curves dealing with sine is a little bit more tricky than cosine, 
but it still can be done. You just have to remember a lot of little extra rules. Okay, and so that's it for rose curves. Now we have one more special type of polar graphs that I wanna take a look at before we close out this lesson. And so here's that last type. This last type of special polar graphs, there's only two of them. These two graphs are it, and these are called lemniscuits. And if you're having a hard time pronouncing the word, just think of the word biscuits and then say lemniscuits. That's kind of how I remember it. But anyway, lemniscuits are pretty cool. They basically look like infinity signs. And we have a version where we're working with cosine and a version where we're working with sine. And so here's a general form for these graphs. You'll have r squared is equal to some constant a squared times cosine of two theta, or r squared is equal to a squared times sine of two theta. If it's cosine, then you'll have an infinity symbol that rests right along that polar axis where each loop is going to reach out to a distance of a, that radius will be a right there. And then when you're working with sine, your infinity symbol will kind of be along that angle of pi divided by four, right? Halfway in between pi divided by two and zero. And each of these loops will also reach out to a radius of a. All right, and then one more thing to mention about these graphs. I mentioned this for our other special polar graphs as well that if the constant in front of cosine of two theta or sine two theta, this a squared, that constant, if it's negative, then you will need to change your graph slightly. In this case, you will need to reflect them about the pole or about the origin. Basically what that means is that you need to rotate your graph 180 degrees or an angle of pi. So for example, in our case with cosine, our graph, instead of being an infinity sign along the polar axis, we will rotate that 180 degrees or an angle of pi and we'd have that infinity sign about the vertical axis instead. It would look something like that. Now I'm not gonna keep that there, but that's what it would look like. And then in the case where we're working with sine, if that constant was a negative, you would also need to rotate this graph 180 degrees, and that would end up looking something like this. All right, again, not a perfect graph, but you kind of get the idea. You just have to rotate your original graph 180 degrees. You have to reflect it about the origin or about that pole. Okay, so that's all you have to do if that constant in front of sine or cosine in this case is a negative constant, okay? So those are our lemniscuits, which is the last type of our special polar graphs that you should be aware of. Remember that we had limassons, rose curves, and now lemniscuits. And I realize that that's probably a lot to take in, but just know that it's not necessary to memorize all these different graphs. It's certainly helpful, but you can always use that method from before where you make use of coordinate points and symmetry to graph any polar graph. But as we do get further into topics using the polar coordinate system, it's going to be helpful if you can quickly sketch these graphs by being able to recognize certain types of polar equations as special polar graphs. And so I would encourage you to try to get familiar with these special graphs as it's going to be immensely helpful later on when you're going to want to be able to graph these polar equations quickly. Okay, and so with that, if you want to see some examples of graphing basic polar graphs, special polar graphs, and using that other method of plotting points and using symmetry, feel free to check out my examples video for this topic that I'll have linked at the end of this video as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time. <laughs>